We thank you for joining us. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Just think as you sit there and you listen to me, you get to hear my voice and all the reflection and attitude and just about everything I can think of that I know about who I am as I broadcast to you live. The power of the voice is an amazing tool, especially in this day and age when so many people seem disconnected when they'd rather communicate with each other even though they're sitting next to each other texting by cell phone or generally sending email messages. Generally, maybe a quick hi and a couple little notes, and other than that, it just passes off into the night. On our program today, we're going to be talking about the voice, and I'm telling you, you're going to be on a really rich journey here as we do that. Our guest on the program today is author of The Alchemy of Voice, How to Transform and Enrich Your Life Through the Power of Your Voice. He is the master of voice at Shakespeare's Globe from since 1998 through 2008, and he's also trained such people as Vanessa Redgrave, Jonathan Cake, and Simon Callow. I'd like to welcome to the program today our guest, Mr. Stuart Pierce. Stuart, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 Radio program. Well, it's my pleasure, Daniel. It's lovely to speak with you. Is your name Daniel or Dan? Daniel or Dan, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you don't mind. Okay, well, it was a pleasure to speak with you. And how, how is the weather on the Pacific Coast line? Well, right now what we're looking at is an overcast sky, but it's pretty much warm over here in the northwest. How wonderful. It sure. certainly is. Now, why it's, um, I'm here in London, England, and it's very, it's very wintry. <laughs> very wintry. <laughs> like so it's that. wonderful. Thinking of you all there, just although you're under overcast skies, you can see just sort of toasting yourselves up um, for a warm day. Mm, absolutely. Now, uh, let's talk about uh, the alchemy of voice. This here is a really fascinating read. It's not what you would expect. You know, most of the time if you pick up, you know, voice training, the first thing you think about is public speaking, for instance. But you really go into a rich history of the voice and how even through ancient or even religious traditions, how they have always seen the voice or the sound, if you will, as being the vibration of the soul. Mm. Absolutely. Would you like me to come in? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so what, what, what we're dealing with, in, in essence of what you've just said, the thesis is about the fact that sound is at the core of creation. And of course we know this because we, we exchange information about the Big Bang. So we know it wasn't the big silence, it was the Big Bang in a very, in a, in a very simplistic way. And we also know that the very first thing that we as human beings achieved as we arose out of our mother's birth canal um, was to be encouraged to breathe and then make a big sound, the great roar of life, yeah. or however it went. Um, so the, the, these two very, very simplistic things indicate that uh, you know, there's a rich cosmology of sound out there and there's a rich cosmology of sound within us, that sound is at the very core of creation. And so human beings throughout history have been preoccupied with this notion. It just seems that a contemporary society that we've somehow unremembered the significance of what I just imparted. And that's maybe to do with the fact that we are just doing, 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 doing on our texts, as you were saying, or through our MNS, uh, SMS, rather, or through our email devices, and that we're surrounded by a lot of noise. And so as a result of whatever the noise may be, maybe it's monkey chatter in our, ma in our heads or the sounds of machines around us, we somehow have dis in disenchanted ourselves from the power of the fact that sound is at the core of creation. And if sound is at the core of creation, we have within us a sound, a voice, that is about how we create the very substance of our being. So I'm really sort of just uh, uh, hopefully ameliorating on some of the substances that you were bringing up for our listeners. Now, in your book, you talk about how when people begin to connect with their authentic voice, and everyone has a different, I guess, sound or signature, if you will, that it will actually profoundly change their lives. Tell us about that. Um, sorry, I missed the last aspect of your, your statement. Oh, what I was saying was that you uh, say that in your book that as people begin to resonate or connect with their authentic signature, their voice, their sound, that it will actually profoundly change their lives. Describe what that is. Explain what that is. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, so if we look into the nature of our contemporary lives in the West, 
uh, I've I just sort of given an, given an indication of what my experience is. It seems to, that we're always fixated with doing, 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 doing. So there's always so much to do, whether it's to do with a job that we need to do, whether it's to do with errands that we need to do, whether it's to do with the fact that we need to communicate with somebody, or fulfill some other more profound task. We're always doing, 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 doing. And then we reach the end of the day and we realize that we spent the whole day doing, 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 even though we are human beings rather than human doings. Now the interesting thing that this does is that, that this fixation with doing takes us into the other part of our bodies. It takes us into the cerebral dominance. It takes us into the mechanistic Western paradigm. It takes us into the fact that we think that the intellect is the most important thing that maneuvers our journey forward in life. And yet, evidently, there's something else which is going on, which is the nature of what it is to be. Anyway, if we take the, the whole notion of what I've just suggested and the way that it manifests in our voices, wherever we go in the world, we tend to hear a voice that tends to go rather like this. So you can see that I've just shifted my sound into the head. And so um, you know, a lot of our listeners will recognize that this sounds rather like a sort of telecommunication voice, perhaps a voice that we hear in a lot of news readers or news broadcasters, or indeed in uh, the sort of voice that is produced by a lot of people who have a lot of information to share with us. And then we suddenly go back to a very, very different sound where we actually feel the voice not just in our heads but through the entirety of our bodies. I don't know if you can pick this up over these airwaves. Can you, through this telecommunication device that I'm using, can you hear the difference in, this, in the energy? Absolutely. Yeah. So what I've just done is I've effectively gone down into my body. I've taken it away from that, that very cerebral high energy sound where I'm just making sound in the head. I've gone back into my body, and what I'm doing is sitting in the note that I believe defines the nature of my being. This is what I've discovered over the last nearly 60 years to be the sound of my voice that resonates the core of my being. And so effectively what I'm actually doing is placing the sound into the middle of my sternum, the middle of my chest area, which we can also refer to as being the heart chakra. The interesting thing is that when we go back in our history in the Western world, particularly into the Greek-Roman uh, empires, we realize that men and women spent their lives discovering what their voices were in relation to three essential principles, gravitas, veritas, and integritas. In other words, gravity, weight, veritas, meaning truth, and integritas, meaning integrity. And for them, it meant that integrity meant that, that they were actually living an, 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 an authentic truth, that they were speaking their hearts and their minds as authentically as they possibly could for the betterment of all other human beings, not just simply to achieve something for their own, for their own state. But they call this persona. And the interesting thing is we, of course, use that word in, as a derivation for the word that we use, which is personality, and that when we talk about the word personality, we're talking about the quality of somebody's essence. Effectively, as you've just used the word, we, we are talking about their soul. And then we suddenly realize that persona, in Latin, actually means per through sona sound. So effectively, what I'm putting forward is that the uh, Roman people in ancient times and the Greek people in ancient times spent time through their lives developing an awareness of their persona so that they were able to convey the totality of their being through their voices as truthfully and as graciously and as gracefully as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. We can see the counterpart of this in relation to the art of oratory. So that when we, for example, listen to your great president, Barack Obama, Mr. Obama, I call him Obama, you can hear somehow within his voice, particularly during the great orations that he's given, like his inaugural speech and the speech that he, 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 he imparted the other day, um, whilst he and Michelle had been to visit uh, that, that extraordinary <coughs> statesperson that unfortunately was shot in the head. I understand that she's doing really well recovering. Yes. But he gave the most extraordinary speech about what his experience was as he walked into the hospital ward. And when he spoke this, he spoke it with these three considerations of integrity, of 
of verity and of weight. Because if there's one thing that we can anticipate from Mr. Barack Obama is that he will always, always communicate to us using the whole weight of his being. And this resonates through his voice. So, Dan, that sort of gives a context for what I'm really talking about in the sense of where we're coming from as human beings. And I suppose the question that may rise out of this is, well, if this is so, how can this sound be used to transform and enrich our lives? Well, you can probably hear that as I begin to speak, there's a certain degree of harmony involved in the way that I speak. Uh, which possibly is not present. When I suddenly move up here and I start to use this sort of sound, because maybe you feel that I'm slightly more tense or stressed or that I'm talking at you rather than speaking to you, Mm -hmm. and that you'd much prefer to be listening to this sound than to the one that I was just making. (laughs) So putting it into some form of context, does that help with it? Does that answer your question? Well, it certainly does. In fact, uh, I believe at least in my experience anyway, after I began reading uh, the book The Alchemy of Voice, is that I began to actually listen to people a lot differently than I used to. Uh, you know, yeah. We always hear in communication one of the key elements is listening. But the truth is we may hear people, but do we truly listen to them? Because if mm-hmm. we did, especially according to uh, what you were describing in your book, is that you would begin to understand them much differently than you would have if you were just passively hearing what they had to say. Yes, yes. It was so often listening for information, aren't we, Mm -hmm. so that we can then act upon that information, as opposed to really perceiving what the quality of the information is and where it arises from. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you experience this, so I, I know I certainly have, um, that in, in social intercourse, in conversation with people, that often they're so trying to interrupt what one's saying, to add their statement, right. that we often don't finish what we wish to communicate. We often don't unpack our heart's content or reveal the totality of what we're thinking. So I don't know if um, this is something that the, the listeners may find useful, but um, often when I'm with, with people who interrupt me, whether this be in a business meeting or indeed with friends, I very graciously say, um, can I just have one more, mom- one more moment to finish this? Because I actually haven't finished. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a way of doing that graciously, obviously. <laughs> there's a way of, be- of doing it very aggressively. If we do it aggressively, then we're not really unpacking our heart's content. We're just getting angry. <laughs> Um, whereas if we're really caring about what we're saying and really caring about the people to whom we're speaking or indeed the situation that we find ourselves in, that we always make a higher choice rather than a lower choice. Now, you described in your book uh, the profound impact that the change of the voice, and, or at least coming from the heart, can be, and you described a fascinating story uh, about some World War II uh, and camp people who actually performed uh, music. Tell the listeners about that story. That, to me, was really quite fascinating. Yes, this was given to me many years ago by a very famous man called Theo Gimbel, who was one of the great pioneers of color therapy, um, which, again, sort of extrapolates the whole idea of what we're talking about in sound. And I suppose if I put it into a context for the listener, there, there may be an understanding that if we, when we look into the most powerful energy that we have within our universe, the energy is that of light. But we know that when light downloads, so to speak, it extrapolates, it expands into something we call color. And then when color downloads, it becomes sound or harmonic resonance. And these are the building blocks of what we know to be matter, the building blocks, if you like, of, of a particular extraction of molecular energy. And so we're dealing with a very, very powerful, uh, very powerful um, instrument in sound. And so the incident that Dan's talking about is having met this very remarkable man who pioneered color and light, or indeed sound, therapy uh, many years ago. He, he, he is no longer, no longer with us. He told me the experience that he'd heard of during the Second World War in one of the terrible Nazi concentration camps. 
and that in one of these camps there were a number of men who had played in the great orchestras of Europe. And during their hardship and the horrors that they experienced, they came together in the conversation of creating the music that they knew by heart, not just by head, but by heart, that they had played so many times in the great concert halls and the great opera houses of Europe. And so they were actually started to recreate the operas. And one of the one of the devices that I think they used was to use burnt wood as charcoal and began to write the scores of these great operas mm-hmm. onto old sacks, or old potato sacks that they were given by the Nazis. And then, of course, musicians would step forward and um, they would somehow imitate the sounds of their instruments. The Nazis became so involved with the joy of what was being created, the beauty of what was being created. So they actually granted them instruments and they started playing violins and cellos and so forth and so forth. And then men stepped forward, young men and middle-aged men stepped forward who had the ability to sing these scores. So, of course, the young men played the women's part and um, the middle-aged men played the parts that they were destined to play. (laughs) And um, the young men, over a period of time, in the middle of their puberty or just in post-puberty, stopped growing body hair, and their voices became falsetto rather than going through the natural pitch break that happens during puberty. Mm -hmm. And they started to manifest the production of very large pectoral muscles that looked rather like breasts. So in other words, what this gentleman was sharing with me is that there were huge physiological changes from a hormonal stimuli, from an endocrinological stimuli that were taking place within the body of these people as they used sound within that context. Now obviously we're talking about a situation that was extraordinarily heightened, being within a concentration camp constantly in fear of one's life with the horrific stories of one's brothers and sisters being possibly gassed or murdered or hanged or shot that they you know we we've seen Schindler's List we've seen the movie by Polanski of the piano we've seen the horrendous conditions that these people lived in so I, I suggest this simply because not because of what we already know but because these people would have been living a very heightened existence and therefore, light, color, and sound living in these heightened situations within our bodies becomes extremely peaked, extremely optimized. So isn't that extraordinary? I think it's actually it's fascinating because as I was reading that, I thought to myself, especially when I lived on the East Coast, is how I was picking up the different dialects and, I guess, certain... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word here, inflections, I guess, because there were so many different types of those on the East Coast. I found that as I would use those, that my personality, I guess, would change. And I found that quite amazing that what you were saying in the book was so true. And there was even a period of time, for instance, that I really enjoyed the Southern drawl, especially from the Southeast with the courtesies and etiquettes and as I would actually begin to articulate those through my own speaking, I would realize you just take on sort of a different character altogether, and I can see why actors really enjoy their craft when they really reach into themselves and are able to pull that out and and basically share it with an audience. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're talking about the way that energy fundamentally changes within our bodies. Right. Um, And as a result of energy changing in our bodies, we feel differently. The interesting thing, of course, is for the person who changes their voice, whether it's to do with accent or dialect modification, because they're moving from the deep south into a metropolitan community like Washington, Philadelphia, or New York, that there is another cultural sound which is used in those cities, and so there's a modification Um, I see this as neither being good or bad. I just see it as being something where we shift our purpose. Do those people fundamentally change within their soul, within their essence, within the core of their personality? 
Um, well, the likelihood is that they don't. But what they feel is that the expression of their personality shifts to accommodate a linguistic which is perhaps more in harmony with the landscape that they find themselves in rather than the landscape from which they've arisen. Otherwise, you'd see, we would see that individuals would change themselves utterly. Um, and what I'm, what I'm suggesting by that is I don't believe that the inner core of the individual shifts. I believe that the way that we perceive them shifts, which is why, for example, if we see um, one, of, one of your great actors, um, um, like Nicole Kidman, or change her dialect, or um, Jake Gyllenhaal playing in Prince of Persia, we hear him using a very different dialect from the dialect that he used in Brokeback Mountain, for example. Mm -hmm. So the energy of his being shifts so that the expression of his energy is different. But fundamentally, I believe that there are trace elements that are always similar within Otherwise, there would be, a, you know, there would be a complete transformation process. Do you see what I mean? I do. In fact, it started making me think of uh, people in film uh, voices, for instance, that I found that you're just drawn to. For instance, one of my favorites is James Earl Jones. Mm. And there was a movie out there, and it's unfortunate that it's hard to get a hold of, but it was called Grim Prairie Tales. And this is a movie where he's actually, back in the 1800s, as a greasy bounty hunter, runs into a sort of a city boy, if you will, out on the plains in the middle of nowhere United States. And they sit down over a campfire and they swap stories. <laughs> and mm. I thought, what a perfect movie for a guy with a voice like his. Mm, mm, mm. And, of course, the, isn't that interesting, you know, the, the whole context of going back into the 18th century or the 19th century where people live their lives not surrounded by TV screens or by computer screens or, indeed, by the radio. Mm -hmm. And, therefore, that they entertain themselves sitting around fires, whether it be in the outback or whether it be in their own homes or their offices, sharing stories. And we all know that when we're in a situation where people are sharing stories, we all know this because we all experienced it when we were kids at school, particularly when we were very young, part of our great cultural process, whichever nation we arise out of, was communicated to us by the great stories that our kindergarten teachers or our, you know, our early grade teachers gave us and how enraptured we were. Can you still remember those great stories, Dan? Well, it's not only that I can remember them, but it was also such an influence that I myself enjoyed doing the same thing, not only with my own children, but as I had the opportunity in groups to tell stories, some of them that I remembered from when I was at camp, some of them I would come across and just was able to share. <clears throat> in fact, uh, there was a time when I was with my son during out his outdoor school in the sixth grade, that I was pretty much in charge of the boys' cabin, and so each night as they would lay down to get ready to go to sleep, I would tell a story. And, of course, yeah. each one was better than the next, but the thing about telling a story is it's more than just telling it. You really experience it, yeah. so therefore the person listening is doing the same thing. It's almost like you're not there anymore, but they're in the story itself. Yes. <clears throat> brilliant, 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 which is um, and maybe unwittingly supporting the whole substance of what I was sharing with, with our listeners at the beginning of the fact that mm -hmm. sound is at the core of creation. So the, the simplicity of what we're describing is that by hearing, you literally experience. When we're sounding, we experience something very deep inside. And I'm reminded in these moments of a radio interview that I did quite recently, in fact, two radio interviews, in Europe with a station that I um, do a monthly program for called radiolightworker.com, which is mentioned on my website, thealchemyofvoice.com, mm -hmm. where I interviewed somebody that I met only quite recently in October of last year in Dublin. I met a bard. I met a shenaki, 
one of the men, and this happened to be a man, it could have been a woman, but one of the men who actually tell stories that are derived from the great sounds of nature. Wow. That's how these great stories initially arose into the bodies of these great people, and that they told these stories by listening to the sounds of nature, by listening to the elements speak through them. And then they form them into the sounds that we now call words that communicate intelligence to one another. But of course they were in these contexts that we've just described, of being a camp around fire, fires, or, um, or in natural situations, you know, surrounded by sea or rock or waterfall or trees in forests, or indeed in your great nation, having just mentioned the prairie, you know, being out there in the middle of nowhere and just listening to these extraordinary sounds. And so the listeners maybe, if they're interested in, in the substance of what we're sharing in these few moments, is that they may be interested in looking into those. There are two one-hour-long interviews where I interview this extraordinary man who formulates sound in this way. And you can hear, as you, ex you can experience in your body what you hear as he changes the elemental conduct of the energy within his own body through his voice. James Earl Jones, of course, has a fascinating <coughs> voice. Um, may I ask, I mean, what do you feel in the quality of his voice are you most drawn to? What I have, and it's, that's an easy question to answer, is you get this feeling of grandfatherly warmth, like you're mm. sitting on his lap with your head against his chest, and there's that rumbling, deep voice of his that just brings comfort to you. Yes. <clears throat> that's, to me, yes. you know, my experience with him anyway. Now, the difference is... I think that's is, amazing. I'm sure that we would all, all of us, we would relate to what you've just said. It's something to do with the weight. It's to do with the gravitas, this huge, soothing warmth where you feel as though his voice is like this amazing organ just sharing with you the richness, the weight, the immensity, and the intimacy of the way that he feels the story or indeed feels the currency of life moving through him. And isn't that interesting that weight, gravity, always has this effect on us. Mm -hmm. It allows us to feel that the person is truly the author of what they're saying, of what they're thinking and feeling. And therefore they have true authority that there is a purpose and a weight. Often, of course, that weight arises out of great stillness, doesn't it? Where you feel that they're very calm. Mm -hmm. Very much so. So, you know, there's a very simple thing that the listeners can try uh, uh, by on, the, on their pets, if they have dogs or cats, that if they need to admonish the pet by simply saying, stop doing that, if they use that sort of vibration, they'll see that the pet just carries on doing what it's doing. <laughs> but then if they use a much lower tone, one that has weight and says, would you stop doing that? The cat or the dog will automatically stop. And if not, try again. <laughs> and, and of course, we know that our pets are not understanding the word that we're using. What they're feeling is the resonance, the vibration of the sound moving into a different part of their bodies. So the interesting thing in our, in our, in, in our species is that weight or gravitas always communicates might or authority or indeed sovereignty, from a very archetypal level. Mm -hmm. I was also reminded of another favorite voice of mine when it comes to, I guess, acting movies, is George Takai, who played Sulu in the original Star Trek series. Mm -hmm. And when you would see him interviewed, it's like, can you make this interview go for another hour? Because you just found yourself enraptured by listening to the way he graced you know, the way he talked. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. It's, it's the, a similar vibration, isn't it? The, um, at the beginning of the great epic stories, the Lord of the Rings in, in, in film, mm -hmm. you can hear a narration given by the great actress Kate Blanchett, who's a voice, who has a voice that I love listening to whatever, whatever part she plays. As an actor, she, she seems to shapeshift. But in her narration for Lord of the Rings, she has this extraordinary weight 
that seems to magnetically draw one in. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's the quality that we're talking about, you know, how to become a magnetic speaker. Surely that if we're drawing people into the richness of the way that we feel life to be by our voices, through our voices, from our voices, we begin to transform and enrich not just ourselves, but the human intercourse that we're conducting, all our relationships, and indeed the space in which we are all, the situation in which we are placed. Now you give an example. The interesting thing is that we tend to live our lives so busily that we don't. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes too busily. (laughs) Sorry? Too busily, I believe. (laughs) We live our lives by doing, 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 and then we're suddenly shocked because something goes wrong within our bodies. And as a result of that, because we're so stressed out, we need to find profound recovery in, in our living. And then we go back to using a sound which is actually much more centered and much more alive within us. So I'm putting forward an idea which may be seemingly new to many of us, but actually is a very old, old story. Uh, Ancient peoples were involved in this. But then something changed. Something radically changed at the beginning of the 17th century, because as, as, as Dan was saying earlier, one of the jobs that I had for a number of years was the to help with the reconstruction of Shakespeare's Globe Theatre. Um, which I did from 97 through to about 2008, 2009. And um, one of the things that I discovered at that time was by reading a lot of the old texts from the 17th century was that the Elizabethans believed that all speaking was decorated silence. Where do we hear silence today? So our forebears lived in great periods of silence and therefore allowed their voices to meaningfully decorate the silence with their heartfelt feeling and their precise thinking. So if we can somehow find a way of being able to relive these possibilities we move from disenchantment into enchantment. And of course I use the word um, aimfully in the sense of the fact that to, to produce sustained tone is often referred to as being chanting. Um, and of course there is always a thought behind the chant or indeed a thought behind the song that is like a chant because thought creates reality. But the interesting thing is that when we begin to sound it, as you were saying earlier, it becomes this profound experience where sound crystallizes intention. And this can be in a really rudimentary situation. It can be just driving into a gas station and and talking to the the guy behind, or the person behind the cash register. It can be picking up one's phone and telephoning um, an agency to receive water or electricity or telecommunication processes, or it can move into much more purposeful or perhaps more profound situations in our lives. But we can actually somehow recreate uh, some of the magic of the enchantment. We begin to see that human intercourse is enriched, is empowered, and is made more gracious or more harmonic. And as a result of that, human beings get on with one another infinitely greater than they do if there's a tremendous amount of cacophony or disharmony being experienced. So there's something very powerful going on. Now, if I can take this further into an understanding of what's going on in the world of medicine, we're beginning to see that sound is the, is the medicine of the future. So we know that ultrasound is being used extensively um, not just simply to pass sound waves over the over the belly of a pregnant mother so that we can actually see the unborn fetus through a um, computer monitor, but we're, we also know that ultrasound is being used more and more and more to diminish tumor in people's bodies. So just as laser can be used 
to, as it were, bite through or cut through dense matter to produce change. So sound, through ultrasound, can be used. And maybe in stillness and in silence, when we appreciate the fullness of sound, we can begin to see that there's something very magical taking place within sound that can improve, that can transform, that can enrich in our lives because of the way that the sound is experienced in our bodies and not just in our heads. Mm. So um, there, there is another area, I'm sure you've, you've already touched into it, Dan, in the book, where I talk about the nature of sound being used in a medicinal context and that how often people come to me who are very severely challenged by physical dis-ease, and how I'm using sound as a sound healer to check what they're experiencing in the sense of finding ways of being able to entrain the negativity of what they've been thinking and feeling that has produced the physiological dysfunction, and changing it into something which is infinitely more positive, so that the sickness that they're experiencing literally moves from the disharmony into harmony and the sickness disappears. Because whenever we are diseased, it's to do with the fact that we're holding profound disharmony, dis, dis- miscreated resonance within our bodies. There's a question since you had actually worked <clears throat> with Simon Callow, as many people remember him from being a judge on one of the many entertaining shows where we try to find singing talent, for instance, is they might ask, so is his signature voice that of sarcasm, or is he just that way because authentically he's letting people know you either belong doing this or you don't? (laughs) Oh, I think we're talking about two different people. I think you're talking about Simon Cowell. Oh, I guess I am. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) Whom I haven't worked with. God bless him. I haven't worked with him. Okay, my apologies. the actor. (laughs) <laughs> okay, yes, the actor, of course. But, you know, what's really interesting is that you do work that works with people, for instance, on stage, pretty much anybody, and they're really, to me, between that and, and a movie being made, there's quite a contrast because what I loved about live theater is that as they were really good with their craft, and you can see where voice, inflection, tone, pace, all of these things really matter, to draw you into the story that you forget that you're watching actors, but you're really partaking in a particular scene of life, for instance. Mm. And so you can relate with that and really connect with it. Yeah, it's, in, it's, it's really interesting, isn't it? The, demand, the demands of a theater player um, can sometimes be different, if not more extreme, than from a cinematographic player. It's just a very different craft that's being used. But the point is that, as you were just saying, we experience something quite huge when we're in the same room, even if it's a very large room, which we normally call a theater, with players on the stage. Um, And, of course, you know, for many, many years, for over 30 years, I've been involved in the training of the actor um, and also embracing the training of the young American actor and introducing the young American actor to the nature of classicism. This was something that I've done for many, many years. And in fact, just last week, was in New York City, um, working with uh, a group of CEOs. But at the same time, on the Friday evening, I had a great pleasure of going to a book signing of The Alchemy of Voice at the New York, Center, New York City Drama Bookstore. And many of my ex-students came along, who are now living very illustrious careers. So yes, the, the, the ability of sound to move through the great chambers that we call theatres is very interesting. And of course, many of those theatres we know um, are built acoustically to resonate the actor's voice in the most harmonious or indeed in the most optimized way possible. Whereas it, when we're filming, whether it be for TV or the larger screen, that there are microphones that do all the work and a lot of very extraordinary computer technology that can shift the quality of an actor's voice Mm -hmm. to produce some of the resonance, some of the inflection, some of the tonal patterns that here we are referring to. Um, So my job has mostly, with actors, been about those that are not necessarily working through the small or large screen, 
but those that are actually moving on to a large platform to live in the way that you were just suggesting, Dan, by holding a mirror up to nature. And here it's unusual, isn't it? Because there they are living these slices of life in very unnatural situations often. I mean, you know, being, playing a very, very intimate scene as though it were a, a, literally a mirror of your life in front of 1,600 people is slightly unnatural. <laughs> so how do they, uh, how do they attune themselves into a physical state that is reflecting or radiating the slice of life that indeed we're referring to. And of course we know that sometimes we're in situations where their reflections, their radiations, are not as precise as they could be. And often we're displeased by that, particularly when we spent 55 or $65 on our tickets. <laughs> um, and so you know, we, we're, we're, we're slightly anxious about that. Sometimes we even leave, um, which is somewhat different from when we're watching the TV or indeed watching the large screen. Mm -hmm. So I suppose what we're really sharing is the, that the, state, the heightened state that the actor on stage is entering into is something which is, which is processed through the whole nature of the way that they feel their body moving through space, the way that they feel the tempo of their body moving as they move through space, and the way that they actually inhabit the gravity of their bodies so that they feel easy, because we can only give the best of ourselves when we're relaxed. When we're tense, we only give one small part of ourselves, which for the actor is a disaster area because it means that they're not creating spell, the spell that their audience really wishes to see. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know that, you know, if, I, if I just expand from the world of acting into the world of corporate speak or indeed the world of public speak, that more people are more terrified of public speaking than they are of dying. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've done for many years, simply because I was drawn into the world of public speaking, um, is to help people develop physical and vocal skills that allows them to be radiating sense as persuasively, as dynamically, as magnetically as they can to keep the audience, whether they be one, ten, a hundred, or a thousand, happy. You gave a really interesting uh statistic in here just about that and it was a uh, neuro-linguistic programming that mm. talks about how the mind works and one of the things that you talk about and there is that there are three elements that that an audience or a person will pay attention to as someone is speaking 55 percent are drawn by your body language 38 percent are drawn by the tone or the sound of your voice but only seven percent really Pay attention to the content. That's quite amazing. When a lot of people mm. think it's the content everybody's coming to see, but when you think of, for instance, like Deepak Chopra, when he's doing his lecture tours, people are just enchanted by listening to what he's saying, not so much uh, what he's talking about. Mm. Mm. It's just really isn't fascinating. That, isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it goes back into that whole substance of what I was sharing earlier, that we become, over the last 400 years, through the advent of modern science, we become so fixated by the intellect mm -hmm. that we think that the message is all, that the content is all, and it's palpably not that way. Now, obviously, if we have somebody standing in front of us that's just talking a lot of, a lot of rubbish, then we're not <laughs> we going to have a lot of those. <laughs> so <laughs> um, what we're really saying is that thought is important, but what we're also saying is that it can be reductionist in the sense of the fact that if somebody is not really embodying the way that they're thinking and feeling, that their bodies, their voices can radiate a sound that is actually not very enchanting to listen to. But as soon as they bring that all together, then um, they seem to be much more harmoniously disposed. And in fact, you know, um, it, it's now uh, nearly six o'clock here in the evening time in, in Europe. And um, just before we came online, Dan, I had two people call me because they'd moved through my corporate website, stuartpierce.com, where I work as a public speaking coach, taking these great craft skills that we've been talking about in relation to the great actor into that context. And these two people who called me completely independently are very leading managers in their fields, one being a leading HR 
who has spent a lot of time in front of large audiences but still feels that she can improve her game, that she can improve her skill set, because she still feels extraordinarily nervous. And they both said, completely independently, I know what I want to say, so why can't I say it? Ah. So the statistics that NLP bring to our consciousness, I slightly aberrate them into 60, 30, and 10, but it's all successful communication is based on 60% body language. I mean, it's 50, 58% in the book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm just simply aberrating them slightly. 60% um, body language, 30% voice tone, and 10% content. So it's palpably true that it's actually not just all about what we're thinking. It's also to do with what we're feeling, because in our corpus, in our bodies, they are the temples for our soul, and feeling is the language of the soul. So this is where we feel the enormity of what we're saying. And of course, as you've just mentioned, the great Deepak Chopra, when we listen to him, he's just so enchantingly and so ravishingly exquisite in everything that he says. Even though there he is talking in this Indian accent, which also <laughs> has quite a lot of sibilance, you know? Right. But there's something so, so beguiling, so enchanting. Um, it's, it's slightly different when we listen to Mr. Obama, but he's basically doing the same thing in a different context. Mr. Obama is not Mr. Chopra. Right. Or indeed, is there, neither of them are Mr. Earl Jones. You know, he's James Earl Jones. Um, that, that somehow they have a gravitas, they have an authority, they have a warmth, and they have an extraordinary way of being able to conjure words and images that describe the substance of what we're speaking about. And therefore, our lives are changed. And isn't it interesting that here we are talking about them? Because I believe fundamentally that when our lives are changed in these ways by great speakers, by great sounders, that we always remember these experiences. I'm sure that we can, that uh, many of the American population who are of an age can remember some of the great broadcasts that were broadcast at the time of the Second World War with that phenomenal president that you then had. Mm -hmm. Or indeed, if we look into the European context and the island of the United Kingdom that, I'm, that I'm, I arise from, that we can remember the voice of Churchill. Mm -hmm. Or indeed, you know, other great states people, and Margaret Thatcher was also a voice that I worked on in the early part of her premiership. And you can hear the very distinct change. It's just that many of us then became disenchanted with her policies or indeed with her communication process. God bless her. But at the same time, her voice was always communicating something of enormous proportion. So we remember these occasions. We remember the occasion when we first heard that great story being shared with us when we were babies. And we were enraptured by the magic of the way that these epic and lyrical stories communicated something about the purpose of life and how we could learn more about becoming better people. I, so when I'm working with the alchemy of voice, what I'm doing is I'm taking these possibilities into different fields of life, whether it be the world of acting or indeed the corporate world, or into mind, body, and spirit, the world of spirituality, and understanding that spirituality is a movement back into wholeness, that as soon as we become whole, we begin to resonate a harmonic degree within our bodies, whereby physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, we literally become more sound. Mm -hmm. Therefore, life becomes more joyous. And of course, the interesting thing about the fact that when life becomes more joyous, the one thing we want to do is to communicate with others about the joy that we're feeling. And if they're not feeling joy, we wish to transform their state. So here we are introducing ourselves to a finite way, maybe, in which we can communicate the joy of our own life purpose and to radiate that joy into the lives of others when they are perhaps less fortunate than ourselves. And I believe we can do this on every single level that we wish to describe, and therefore we move disenchanted people into enchantment. We move dispossessed people into being possessed about their lives. We move disenfranchised people into feeling as though they have 
a contribution to the world rather than nobody is listening to them. Mm -hmm. I keep remembering the movie uh, The Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams, and there was a scene yeah. where he was working with one of the students to show him that he had poetry within him. And the simple statement that he made is that he, you know, this student, I can't remember the name, seems to believe that everything inside of him is worthless. And what's amazing about that statement is as you listen to people talk, you can pick up that's how they feel about themselves. And you talk real extensively in the book about cellular memory. So these are memories that we may have where perhaps, let's call it being unworthy, for instance, that may have stemmed from you growing up, but it's amazing how you transmute that particular memory through your voice as you speak with other people. Absolutely, yes, and thank you for introducing the notion of transmutation, which of course is right at the very core of the alchemy. Um, that we have these memories on a cellular level deep within. Of course, if there is a memory of something that is uncomfortable, there is also a memory of something that is comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so what we begin to realize is that we have a very powerful tool in our midst, which is the recognition that nothing is singular, everything is plural. The difficulty is that when we're in very heightened situations in our lives, where we are sorrowed or we are unwell, or we are challenged very severely, we only think that there is one thing, whereas there is always palpably two things that wherever there is hate, there is love. Wherever there is guilt, there is innocence. Wherever there is depression, there is always expression. And in the book, I give a whole list, um, which only begins one infinitesimal list, of course, that goes off, because the currency of our planet is nothing is singular, everything is plural. So the whole point of transmutation is that we identify what it is that is negative within us, and then we recognize fully what the positive is, and we use sound, we use the power of sound to transmute the notion of the dis-ease into ease. And so transmutation is a really powerful core alchemical tool that we can use to shift any situation in our lives. And, uh, and I think, Dan, you probably touched into, there are a number of major case studies within the book that illustrate... Uh, the nature of the way that human experience can be shifted, um, particularly well, there, are, there are case studies, as it were, littered all the way through the book, but particularly in the epilogue, which is an addition that I put into the book for the publication through the great publishing house Findorn, FindhornPress.com, mm -hmm. who <clears throat> have become my publisher, and indeed are publishing all of my works. I've just also, um, we're beginning to bring out another book, the second book, called The Heart's Note, which is an extension of the work of the alchemy of voice and understanding how the heart is at the very core of creation because as we were saying at the beginning of our conversation, it's the very corpus of the signature note that exists within our beings. Except the devastating fact is that acute cardiology in the Western world is on an increase by 65-70% every year and what that means is that more people are dying of heart attacks. So what the alchemy of voice and the heart's note purport to inject into our consciousness is a way of being able to become much healthier about the way that our heart's resonance, our signature note, the very song of our soul, resonates in our lives. The heart, you see, in all cultures has been referred to as being the seat of the soul. Mm -hmm. So if the listeners are interested, as well as um, you know, having finished the alchemy of voice and trying all the possibilities of the subtle exercises that are experientially noted throughout the book, there's always a possibility they may want to move on to the next book, The Heart's Note, which I understand will be publicized or published rather in the United States in February and March of this year. Very fascinating. So maybe, Dan, when that comes out, we may even have an opportunity of having another conversation because this has been so fun talking <laughs> to you. It really is. I think what's powerful about this, what I love about the alchemy of voice, especially for those of you out there who would really like to tap into that core of who you are and be able to communicate that, 
is that what you'll discover is a true law of attraction working because of something that's expressed from within you authentically. But the other thing, too, is I'll share with people when I have really great interviews, and, and they happen probably, I, I want them to happen more often than they do, but you get to a point where as you're involved with a guest, that there's a certain divineness that comes through to where you're really not you anymore. You become lost in the alchemy, if you will, of what it is you're doing. So what you're expressing really is you, but it isn't you all at the same time. It's like you're lost and you found yourself at the same time. And I think that's what makes something like this so fascinating. And the way that you outline your exercises, it's kind of interwoven with great education as well as fantastic stories. It just makes it a really grabbing read and a must-have book for your shelf, especially when you want to improve your life and see you getting and achieving and being the things that you want. Wow, <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you very much. I love, I love what you just said, <laughs> and the very notion of the fact that it's a must-have book. Please go out and buy it. Very inexpensively found through www.amazon.com or indeed www.findhornpress.com, with all the other things that I'm bringing out. So thank you for that that wonderful appellation there, Dan. That was absolutely fantastic. And I hear you, I hear you. What's been so wonderful for me in our conversation is that there is a super coherence taking place. So I feel that as we speak, although I feel your vibe at the other end of this um, this telecommunication device that I'm using, I can also he- feel that there's another presence between us. Mm. And that I believe that when we establish this level of harmony, this level of super coherence, that something truly divine comes in. And what other, what other prize is there but to be in connection with the divine? Absolutely. The Alchemy of Voice is the book, Transform and Enrich Your Life Through the Power of Your Voice. Our guest, Stuart Pierce. Stuart, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Bless you. It's been absolutely wonderful talking with you, Dan. And well, farewell to all the listeners. I hope we meet again. We will be. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. Again, the book is The Alchemy of Voice. You can also visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com where we will have links to this so you can find out more about it. That is the number 50. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past half.